Um, I would encourage everybody, if we could, uh, to go ahead and take a seat. We'll go ahead and start our presentation today. Um, first and foremost, uh, I appreciate everybody coming and uh, spending some time with us today as we talk about the water tower, both those that are here in person and we also have a live stream going on, so some people online. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Chris Fredrickson. I'm the City of Idle Falls Public Works Director. So I'll probably chat here for a little bit, um, but I would like to introduce some of the people from the city here. Um, we have David Richards, our uh, water superintendent. We have Kent Fugel, who's our city engineer. Um, we have Chris Canfield, who's the assistant public works director. We also have Robert Wright, who's the library uh, director. In the back, we have Carrie Hammond. She's our public information officer for public works. She also, we share her with the Idle Falls uh, Fire Department. So if you see a bunch of lights flash back there and Carrie runs out of the room, it means something bad is happening in the city. So, um, and then we also have uh, Eric Gossart. Is that, am I pronouncing that correctly? All right, all right, so uh, another PIL. So they're helping us with the online content that we have today. So we appreciate um, them being here. Um, you know, I'm gonna start the presentation, I guess, today, and I'm gonna apologize right off the bat and the apology I know that's pretty early, but the apology is in the reference to the fact that uh, we're gonna listen to two engineers today. And uh, maybe that's not our best forte that we have. Um, I know back in the day, I've got some gray hair on my head, but back in the day when I was in college, as we sat in a lot of those classrooms, I thought, man, these cats in this room, they're a little bit different group, right? So I recognize that, not me, of course, it was the other 30 people that were in the room, but. It almost looked like a mix of, say, a chess tournament and a Dungeons and Dragons convention or something. So, but we recognize that, but we've tried to make the presentation today as, as non-technical as possible, just to convey the information that we'd like to um, for the project um, that we can. So, as part of the presentation that we'll run through today, we have uh, a very few slides, but we would ask that you keep your questions till the end. And then we have, once that's done, we have staff members that'd be happy to chat with you around any of the boards that we have out here as we run through that. Um, but as we look through this, um, the items that we really wanna cover is really a project review, um, the construction impacts that we anticipate as, as the water tower actually comes to fruition and we're building on that. How does parking work? What will we deal, deal, do to accommodate the parking in the library um, parking lot? What will post-construction look like? And then also, if you're interested in the process in itself, how's the best way to continue to stay informed? So those are kind of the key issues that we wanna talk about. But, but before I turn the time over to Dave, I do wanna just touch on a few issues. You know, you as a user of our water system really have an understanding that every morning when we walk out to that sink, you know, we, we flip the tap on and water comes out, right? That's the intent. And I think the key piece of the puzzle that I wanna point out today the water tower, as it exists, is the key component within our water system and how it's supplied, or that water actually reaches your tap. Without that, we have a dramatically different water system and all of the ability that we have to respond to mechanical concerns, electrical concerns, a lot of those are alleviated based on the water tower that we have today. So it's a key component. And I guess, as I try to um, at least influence what actually you take home from today, if you could just remember that key point that the reason the water tower is so important is it, it protects the user in the end throughout all of the problems that we may experience. So, so that's the key component on the system that we have. But with Dave's group, we also have uh, 19 members of the water division that ensure that happens. And a, a potable municipal water system is somewhat unique in the fact that it works every day. And I stress that every day. You know, you may have power outages, we may have fires, we may have a lot of things. And as in a reference, other utilities, you expect some outages at times, right? But for a water system, at least in a non-third world country, that's something that you expect works every day. And Dave and his group, uh, they they work very hard to make sure that that continues to happen. So, so there's one last point before I turn this over to Dave. Um, I do want to convey, I've been doing this for a little while, and as and as far as producing projects, planning, um, designing, and constructing them. But I have to admit, the climate that we find ourselves in today, and this is a caveat, it is the most unique that I've ever seen, right? We're coming out of a pandemic. We have a war in Ukraine. We have supply issues. We have labor shortages. We have inflation, high gas prices. 
you combine all that together, um, we have a lot of unknowns at this point. And those unknowns come to how quickly can we get materials? We'll try to plan around that. How will the contracting community look at this particular project? And in the end, how will it cost, right? How much will it cost? And so those are kind of the key points that I just wanted to mention before we turn this over to Dave. But, but I've kind of taken enough time. So here's Dave Richards with the presentation. Not only do you have multiple engineers, you have engineers of varying height. So I'm a little bit more diminutive than my boss is. So uh, can everyone hear me okay? All right, I just wanna uh, thank all of you for coming today and those of you that are online as well that have logged in to, to watch this presentation. Uh, it may be a little difficult to see some of the text and everything up on the slides, but bear in mind that we have boards that are created on the side that you can, once the presentation is over, uh, you can go and have staff answer questions and see what that, that text may say. Uh, and for those online, uh, the online, as soon as the presentation is complete, the online portion will be cut. Uh, we have to do a, a hard cut on that as we go around the room and answer questions for those that are in person. Okay, project overview. The, the existing water tower that we have was constructed, is completed in 1937, making it this year uh, turns 85 years old. It currently holds 500,000 gallons, half million gallons. Uh, its height, total height is 185 feet. Now, the purpose of the elevated tower of storing water up there is to supply pressure to the water system. That pressure helps us keep contaminants out of our water system. It helps in times of emergency. It helps uh, when fire flows are needed, as you see a picture there of a, of a fireman uh, spraying water. Uh, supplies us with a lot of things other than just water to your tap. The issues that we've got with the current towers, you can see with the, the pictures on the bottom, the, the paint is failing. Uh, the piping inside the water tower is deteriorating. And the foundations underneath, underneath each one of the legs are, are crumbling, or they're beginning to, to show signs of wear and tear. And the overall, these are just some of the items that, probably the larger items, uh, that have caused, created the need for the elevated water tower to be replaced. One of the big ones is uh, the elevated tower. Well, one of the big reasons we have it also, I'd like to add, is chlorination purposes. Uh, when we add chlorine to our water, if this gives the, the bowl that the water circulates in, gives time for the chlorine to react with the water. So the new tower, the, the type that we've settled on is shown and kind of depicted in a picture. This is an existing tower from uh, South Carolina. It is called a composite tower. The reason it was selected is overall use and operation and maintenance costs are a lot lower with a tower of this type than the other towers that uh, we can build within our seismic zone area. Now, the design plans are still being completed right now. We have engineers that are working on designs, so more information about the design will be coming later as we get uh, closer and ready for bid. Funding, uh, the water division in 2015 created a water facility plan. That facility plan identified this replacement as a project need and also designed rate cases along with all of our other, with our other projects as well. And rates have been adjusted over the last five, six years in order to generate money to fund this project so that the city can fund this in-house without the need for additional funding from other sources. If we are able to find funding from other sources, you know, even better. Updated timeline. The timeline, we started this process in fall of 2019. We began site selection and that's proceeded until uh, just recently here in winter 2021, which is when the library board uh, offered the southeast corner of their parking lot to the city and voted on it allowing the city to move the elevated tower to that location. In April 2020 through fall of 2022, the engineering design was uh, begun and is, will be complete this fall. Fall 2022 through 2024, we anticipate bidding the project and having construction occupy that two-year window. Then once the new elevated tower is operational, complete and operational, we will then be able to drain the existing water tower 
and to uh, remove it from service. Construction impacts. We all know that construction, uh, it's an interesting beast. Uh, we are going to shortlist a number of contractors that do this kind of work. There's just a handful in, in the United States. And there's gonna be some probably negotiations with those contractors as, as the project gets underway. Uh, of course, with construction, we do know that there will be noise with heavy machinery. There will be dust that's kicked up. We can have the contractor do their best to keep that ground wet and keep dust from getting stirred up in the wind. There will be construction fencing uh, around the south portion of the parking lot. There will be a slide coming up here shortly that I'll show you what that'll look like. Uh, Park Avenue and the alleyway right next, just south of the library parking lot. There will be some periodic short duration closures during construction as materials are either delivered or as construction goes up for safety reasons. Uh, there will be underground utilities work that needs to be done. We have to get water line not only from the existing well, uh, which resides just between Idaho Falls Power Offices and the river. We have to get water line from that well to the new elevated tower, plus we have to get lines from the elevated tower out to our existing distribution system. That's how the water gets from the tower and supplies water to our entire water system. There will also be a drain and overflow piping that goes to Park Avenue, which ties into a storm tunnel that's there. There will be a short stretch of uh, sidewalk that will be closed during uh, active construction on Park Avenue, and that's right adjacent to the library parking lot. I'll show you that as well on this next slide. So as you can see, and this might be a little difficult to see some of the font, but these, again, for those that are online, these slides will be made available on the city's website. So you can log on to the city's website and see these slides. Plus those here in person, these slides will be available on the, on the sides of the room for staff questions afterwards. But you can see kind of a purple tone. The purple tone is the construction site fencing. We're occupying uh, the south half of the library parking lot with maybe a couple of stalls on the north half. That's to allow for construction workers to get on and off the site while, at, while work is active, actively happening. You can see that blue circle, that circle is the foundation. That is an excavation where they'll dig down and get down to lava and be able to uh, construct the foundation down below grade. That will eventually get buried. That size that you see there depicted is roughly about 85 feet in diameter. If you can see uh, Park Avenue, which is towards the right of the slide, you can see some red there. Uh, the red with the diagonal lines through it, that's showing you a stretch of Park Avenue that we envision will be closed off periodically as semis come down Park Avenue to have materials delivered to the site. And then if you see right in between the purple and that, that red is the sidewalk. That's the stretch of sidewalk that would be closed off during construction. Now, what would it like once the foundation is complete and they actually start pouring the pedestal, which is what supports the bowl on the top, and they start going vert vert vertical with construction, this is what we anticipate the site looking like. The dark blue uh, center circle you can see is the pedestal. That's about 37 feet in diameter uh, on the outside diameter. Uh, once that pedestal is raised and poured, it'll be probably 150 to 160 feet tall. They'll start uh, welding the steel bowl that actually resides at the top of the tower. They weld that at ground level initially. So when you see that uh, outer ring that says bowl on it, the lighter blue, that is a depiction of the diameter of the bowl. It, it's anticipated to be roughly between 70 and 75 feet in diameter. So they weld that at ground level, and then once they get the majority of it put together and it's fairly stable, they jack that up to the top and then secure it in place. If you see the green squares, uh, the green squares are where we anticipate the contractor staging their cranes for doing various types of work. So really around uh, the quarters of the, of the pedestal and the bowl, they will park their cranes to be able to lift large pieces of steel into place or to lift concrete when they're pouring as they get higher up. Uh, there's a fifth uh, square that's a little to the left of the others. 
that is what they call their, it's a larger crane that they will bring in. That is, once they jack that bowl up to the top, they have to cap it and put the top on. It's what they call their top work. Uh, that's what, that's where they plan on staging the crane to do that work. And uh, what you see in yellow is just a depiction of what it might look like for semi traffic to come into the construction site to do deliveries. They'd come in off of Park Avenue and move their way to the left on the slide towards South Capitol Avenue. If this is needed and uh, to have the trucks come onto the site, we'll probably have them exit South Capitol Avenue. We might have to open up an exit there, construction exit only for them to get out safely. And again, what you see now in red in Park Avenue and also in the alley, these are areas that as they start welding the steel bowl, and as they start doing other work at higher elevations that we anticipate being periodic temporary closures of the road and the alleyway when they're doing construction on that side. We don't anticipate those closures to be too very long, maybe in the form of a week or something that'll have to be discussed with the contractors uh, once a contractor is selected in the bid process. So after construction, what is it gonna look like? We plan on lighting the elevated tower uh, again, you can see a depiction of that elevated tower. It's going to be similar to the one that we want to build. Fencing around the tower, we will have some site security fencing. Uh, we plan on doing a wrought iron fence, and I'll show you in on, on the next slide where that is planned to be. Uh, there will be some landscaping changes to the library parking lot. These landscaping changes allow us to salvage numerous parking stalls that we otherwise would have lost. And then I'll also uh, show you what the library parking looks like after would look like after construction. This is pre-construction as the library exists currently. Green, what you see highlighted in green is existing landscaping. Uh, you got the green circular items, those are existing trees on the site. We anticipate having to remove at least three trees, two in the center island and one on the south side by the alley. There is a third, a fourth tree that is a potential removal if we have to open up an exit going into South Capitol Avenue for large vehicle traffic. The number of parking stalls is identified in the little orange squares, so that you can see a total of how many parking stalls there are. If we look at post construction, again, once everything's done, the only thing you'll see at ground level is the pedestal. So that smaller blue circle remains at ground level. And all the darker green now is the revised landscaping at the library. What happens is we gain about 12 feet of landscaping on the south side. We shrink the center island uh, to five feet, which was significantly larger than that. And then uh, just based off of the new city, the city's new form based code for this area and this zoning, uh, the parking lot, there's certain requirements of islands and tree placements. So all of the new, the green colored trees that you see on there that are kind of a light green, those would be new trees planted as a result of the construction based off of the code. And the existing trees that remain are shown in the dark. They're kind of hollow with the dark green circles around. If you can see around the pedestal, there's a little depiction of the fencing. That's what we propose as being the security fencing. That's to protect the elevated tower from vandalism and other things like that. It is a secured facility, so we want to make it protected. As far as parking stalls, there's the little blue box on the right-hand side of that slide. Existing parking stalls at the library currently are 96, and we anticipate when construction is done that we will be able to maintain 95 parking stalls. So a net loss after the elevated tower is constructed of only one parking stall. This is what we plan on doing, or uh, kind of a depiction of what'll happen with parking during construction. Because we will, as we occupy that south half of the parking lot, that will offset uh, a number of existing library patrons that, uh, that park in that area. So you can see in the center of this, basically there's a little construction cone with a little yellow depiction. That's going to be the construction zone for the, for the contractor. Uh, green that you can see with the P's on it, those are parking lots that are publicly maintained parking lots that we anticipate being able to share with library patrons uh, during construction. That includes, we lose, I think it was 85 stalls thereabout uh, during construction. 
No, I'm sorry, 58. I had my, I'm a little dyslexic today. I transposed my numbers. So we lose 58 stalls. Uh, those public parking stalls, there's 331 stalls. We hope to share those with local businesses, but allow library patrons to, to use those. The orange ones that you see, those are public parking lots, but we'd like to keep those limited uh, to library patrons during off business hours so that the businesses that are closest to those can still occupy those for their uh, their customers. Uh, the, the public parking in green that you can see, there's 331 total stalls that have been identified. The limited stalls after uh, business hours is 246. So we believe that the offset library patrons will have room to park. And we are looking at maybe some with help from the library uh, as you can see, there's a golf cart little image on, on the map here. Those golf carts, these locations may be subject to change a little bit, uh, but we hope to have perhaps a little bit of a library shuttle system from some of these remote parking stalls for perhaps mothers with small children or something like that that would like to park in a certain area and just have a, uh, em employees from the library bring a golf cart around, pick them up, run, shuttle them over to the library, and then bring them back to their cars when uh, when they are done at the library. So that is pretty much the extent of the presentation. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone can stay informed. The best way to stay informed, go to the city's website. You can see the arrow right there on the stay informed button. You can click on that and receive uh, alerts and notifications from the city, uh, from the PIOs as, th as information goes out. That's the best way, one of the best ways to stay involved. There's also the city's got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube uh, postings that go on all the time from our public information officers. You can go on and, and follow the city on those. Also, we'll be providing more information as this project proceeds through local media outlets, whether that be through radio, print, or television ads. Also, on Every one of the posters that you see on here, and for those that are online, if they can go onto the web, the city's website, there is this QR code. You uh, take your smartphone, you open up your camera, hold it up to that QR code, the camera will automatically pull up a link. You select that link off of your camera, and it'll take you right to the city's website for the Water Tower webpage. Now, this is just the first of two, two meetings that we are going to have. The next one will be Wednesday, May 18th, and it will be an evening meeting. We did this on purpose so that those that can come during the middle of the day are invited to come to this one. Those who were unable to do that would like to come to the evening meeting can come on the 18th. It will again be here at the waterfront, Snake River Landing, and there's the address, 1220 Event Center Drive, Idaho Falls. And it, again, will be live streamed. So we'd like to thank you again. At this point in time, we're going to cut the live feed and we'd like to invite every one of you that attended here